You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a PhD holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the revolution to fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 127, The September Campaign, Part 19, The Fall of Warsaw. This week, a big thank you goes out to Kyle and Nicholas for choosing to support the podcast by becoming members. All members get access to ad-free versions of all of the podcast episodes for just one U.S. dollar per month, or whatever that might be in your local currency. Head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more. While the situation around Poland was deteriorating rapidly, in Warsaw, the defense of the city continued. If anything, the defenders of the city grew stronger in the days after the Bezura attack was over, with thousands of troops from a variety of units making their way into the city through the German defensive lines. But even with this increase in soldiers available for the defense, by September 17th, the siege of the capital was becoming something that, that was going to enter its end game. The capital was surrounded, there would be no relief, and there was no escape for a large number of the soldiers and civilians that were now trapped in Warsaw. The Germans would begin a propaganda campaign, dropping leaflets into the city and then communicating to its inhabitants via radio. On the 16th, one of these messages would state, quote, that the ruling Polish caste would grandly sacrifice the entire population of Warsaw without batting an eyelid for the sake of its selfish goals out of pride and blindness, end quote. While a leaflet dropped over the city by German bombers would contain a specific call to action, quote, inhabitants of the city of Warsaw, you are surrounded on all sides. Offering further resistance is senseless. Whoever is encountered bearing weapons will be shot. For every German soldier killed in Warsaw, 20 of you will be shot dead. If the city offers resistance, then it will be destroyed by our artillery and aircraft. Send responsible citizens to our army so that they can surrender the city and protect you from destruction. While the German military would have enjoyed a quick surrender from the city's garrison, they were also prepared to give it some time. But to be clear, the outcome of what was about to happen in and around Warsaw was guaranteed. Really, all that mattered was the timeline. Confidence was so high that the Luftwaffe began to transfer aircraft away from Poland, especially bomber units, which were moved to positions in western Germany in anticipation of operations against the French and British. Even some of the German infantry units were being pulled back from the front, with some of the units of older East Prussian reservists from the 3rd Army being released from service so that they could return home to participate in upcoming harvest activities. But while some German military units were moving away from Warsaw and even out of Poland, on the ground the number of German troops around the capital would actually increase in the days after September 17th. With the Soviet invasion, large numbers of German troops would be reassigned to the siege of the capital, including the entire 8th Army, which had just played the prime role in absorbing the Polish attacks on the Bajura. Concentrating these troops around the city took time, and a real assault into Warsaw could not be launched until they were all ready, and only after sufficient artillery was also transported to areas around the city. This included artillery batteries from the 3rd and 8th Armies already around Warsaw, as well as those that were brought in from the 4th and 10th armies that were positioned further south. It would not be until September 24th that the Germans would order a new full assault on the city, a week after the Soviet invasion had started in the east. By the time that the assault was ordered, the situation within the city was 
getting desperate. The largest problem for both the soldiers defending the city and the civilian inhabitants was food. As soon as supply lines to the city had been cut the week before, the food reserves within the city began to dwindle. But the massive number of refugees in the city just depleted these resources even further. By September 22nd, most available food was already consumed, including most of the army's horses. There was also, of course, the constant German artillery bombardments and bombing raids, which slowly turned the city, or many areas of the city, into ruins. Mayor Strazinski would say this on September 23rd in his daily radio address, quote, I wanted Warsaw to be great. I believed that it would be great. I and my colleagues drew up plans, sketched the great Warsaw of the future, and Warsaw is great. It happened sooner than we expected. Not in 50 years, not in 100, but today I see a great Warsaw. As I speak these words to you, I see her through the windows in all her glory and grandeur, surrounded by billows of smoke, reddened with flames of fire. Magnificent, indestructible, grand, fighting Warsaw. And though the places where magnificent orphanages were to stand are filled with rubble, though, though barricades thickly cover with the bodies of the dead stand where parks used to be, though hospitals are in flames, not in 50 years, not in a hundred, but today, Warsaw is at the height of her grandeur and glory as she fights for the honor of Poland. End quote. This would be Starzynski's final radio address to the capital as on that same day, the Germans were able to knock out the city's primary electrical power station. While Starzynski's radio statements play heavily in the accounts of many who were in Warsaw during these days, another thing that gets some mention is the various broadcasts from British and French radio stations that could be heard in the city. Here is one Polish officer, Ludwig Krozutski, who was north of Warsaw defending the areas around Fortress Maudlin, describing his reactions to these French and British radio broadcasts. Quote, Lovely phrases broadcast by Western radio stations, such as, you are an inspiration to other nations, or history will forever remember your heroism, are taken by the men as a bitter mockery of our current situation. We are not fighting for inspired nations to calmly watch our tragedy from a distance. We are fighting for the very existence of our nation. We have no use for lofty words from our allies, but need specific actions to prove that our allies deserve that name and are truly on our side. End quote. I, I can't say I blame him for these statements and this sentiment. I'm sure it was shared by many. While there was perhaps some frustration floating around due to their situation and the lack of support from their allies, within Warsaw, the morale and fighting abilities of the defenders were both quite high. Artillery was a bit of a problem, with the remaining Polish artillery units starting to run low on ammunition, but there was still plenty of small arms ammunition to keep the Polish units supplied, at least for the time being. This would be of little help on the disastrous day of September 25th, though. The commander of the German 8th Army, General Blaskowitz, would send out orders on the 24th of September for the major and hopefully final German attack on September 26th. The day between the order being given and the start of the attack would see German bombing and artillery resources focusing on softening up the city. The day would come to be known as Black Monday. The Luftwaffe would dedicate 400 aircraft to the operation, with most of them visiting the capital more than once throughout the day. During these visits, they would drop almost 500 tons of high-explosive bombs and over 70 tons of incendiary munitions. Along with the aerial bombardment, German artillery from all around the city started a barrage in the morning and then continued firing all day. These bombardments were not really targeted at any kind of military targets, but were instead just designed to spread suffering and misery throughout the city. Large areas of the capital were already in ruins, and on September the 25th, large swaths were destroyed either by bombs or by the resulting fires. The fires would begin burning out of control in many areas of the city, with there being little chance of putting them out while the fighting still lasted. This meant that throughout the day, the smoke and haze around Warsaw increased in intensity. This destruction put additional pressure on the military authorities within the city, not because of the damage caused to the defenders of the city, who by and large were not the targets of the German bombardment, but because it increased the level of suffering among the civilian population. That suffering would only continue to increase as long as the defense of the city continued. The exact number of people killed in Warsaw on Black Monday is unknown. What is clear is, is that it was probably in the thousands, with some estimates placing it as high as 10,000. 
But as with many such events, and given the administrative chaos of the following days, it was hard to determine the exact time and cause of death for those who perished sort of in the final week of the siege of the city. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. All you need is a few minutes to start your day off with something historic when you listen to the This Day in History podcast. Every day there's a new episode for you to listen and learn about what happened that day way back when. Today could be the day a famous mobster met their end, or the first milestone for humans in space. Who knows what history today holds? Find out when you listen and subscribe to This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. That's This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. Even before the bombardment was over, the German attacks had started on the edge of Warsaw. Small units of German pioneers and assault troops began pushing into the city in small groups throughout the day, slowly working their way through Polish neighborhoods. In many areas, they found that the Polish defenders had already retreated further back into the city as they shortened their defensive lines. The Germans would focus their initial main efforts on a series of forts on the outskirts of the city. These fortifications were old, dating back to the 19th century when they had been built by the Russians. They were made out of red brick and were far from being anything close to modern. The Polish defenders would take advantage of them, though, because they offered better protection than most other areas of Warsaw. This then made them a target for German attacks, especially for their first set of attacks during Black Monday. The next morning, the primary German assault began at 6 a.m., focusing an attack all around the city. The German attacking units heavily outnumbered the Polish defenders, and of course had much better artillery and and air support if they required it. The Poles had spent several days preparing their defenses, mostly through fortifying buildings and putting up roadblocks and barricades to hamper German troop movements. In some areas, the German attacks would experience success, pushing the Polish defenders back into the city, but in others, the fighting very quickly became a brutal stalemate. One of the areas that would see the heaviest fighting was the southwest district of Mukatov. The attack would go quite poorly in this area, and the only way that the German units could make progress was through the use of point-blank artillery fire against Polish positions. This proved successful in prying the defenders out of the buildings, but was a slow and costly process, far from the great attack that the Germans believed they were launching after the resources that they had spent on bombardments during the previous day. But even if they could make the German attacks costly, ammunition would become a problem for Polish units throughout the day. Not just the total amount of ammunition available inside the city, but more importantly the transportation infrastructure to get what was needed to the soldiers that needed it. With so much of the city being hit by German bombs and artillery, the streets were full of rubble and shell holes, and any movement around the city was an arduous task of picking through the debris. There was also the matter of simple exhaustion for the Polish defenders, as there was little ability to reinforce or to provide time for rest. During the evening of the 26th, the German attacks lessened. Polish Colonel Tomaszewski would discuss what it was like when he emerged from his command post where he had been during the previous days. Quote, From an angle, the merging of the flames gave the impression that all Warsaw, including Praga, was aflame, as if everything was a single sea of fire and smoke. People emerged from cellars, foxholes, and hastily dug ditches. Some wandered around in silent despondency, looking for shelter. Others ran to smother the fire to prevent it from spreading. Thousands of corpses were spread across the entire city, barely covered with soil. The cadavers of horses and awful skeletons blocked the roads, beginning to decompose. He would then also comment on the conditions faced by all of those throughout the city during these days. No water for three days. 
Food supplies close to exhausted. The population is beginning to starve. The hospitals are burned down and bombed out. There are 43,000 wounded lying in the most primitive conditions in cinemas, cafes, and cellars. Thousands of corpses are scattered throughout the city with hardly a covering of earth. End quote. Even though the defenders were still holding out, the events of the 25th and 26th caused real conversations to begin at Polish headquarters around surrendering the city to the Germans. General Rommel would lead a meeting of the city's leaders, both military and civilian, to discuss the path forward. The army believed that it was still capable of at least several days of resistance to German attacks, but the eventual outcome remained clear. The question was really if continued resistance was worth it. From a strictly military perspective, with the defeat of the Polish army in almost every other area of Poland and the surrender of almost all formations to either the Germans or the Russians, continued resistance would serve no military purpose. There was also, of course, the people of Warsaw to consider. Mayor Straczynski would provide estimates of around 19,000 civilians who were already known to be dead and around 50,000 more who were injured or needed medical care. With so little to gain by continuing to resist and with the mounting cost in civilian lives, the decision was made to seek a ceasefire and then to negotiate surrender terms with the German military leaders. After the final decision was made, the military headquarters would print out a single-page news bulletin addressed to the people of Warsaw. It was a declaration of thank you to those people, saying that the leaders in the city had decided to surrender to the Germans to end the suffering of the people of Warsaw. It would also state, quote, The population of the capital has set a heroic example of perseverance, resolve, and boundless willingness to sacrifice. With its brave defense, Warsaw has earned the admiration and reverence of free nations all over the world. And its spirit was, is, and will forever be the symbol of the spirit of the Polish nation, because by sacrificing itself, it fought for the honor and independence of Poland. It would also make clear that for Poland, the war would continue, not just in Warsaw, and that ultimate victory would be achieved. Straczynski would also make a final declaration to the people of Warsaw, quote, For the last time, I call upon our allies. I no longer ask for help. It is too late. I demand vengeance. For the burnt churches, for the devastated antiquities, for the tears and the blood of the murdered innocents, for the agony of those torn by bombs, burnt by the fire of incendiary shells, suffocated in this collapsed shelters and cellars. And you, bandits, barbarians, who have attacked our country, carrying death and destruction, know this, that there is justice, that there is a judgment, before which we shall all stand to answer and be held responsible for our actions. End quote. While these declarations were being printed, General Kutsriba, who had started the war at the head of Army Poznan, would begin his journey through the city towards the outskirts to begin discussions with the Germans. The Germans knew that this process was about to begin when Rommel sent a letter requesting a 24-hour ceasefire to allow for capitulation discussions to occur, with the letter being delivered and accepted by the Germans on the afternoon of the 26th, with the ceasefire continuing into the 27th. Kurtziba would travel to the headquarters of the German 1st Army Corps to the east of the city, and there he would meet with General Petzl and be presented with the terms of surrender that had been drawn up by the Germans. The general terms were that all of the Polish military personnel must surrender, and they were not allowed to destroy their military equipment. Under the terms, the enlisted personnel would be released and would be allowed to return home after no more than a few days of captivity. Kurtzriba would agree to the terms as written, and after the agreement was made, Petzl would tell Kurtzriba, quote, The fortunes of war favored our side more. We were adversaries, but we were not personal enemies. End quote. The official articles of surrender would not be signed until the following day, September the 28th. This time, Kurtzriba would travel to the southwest side of the city to officially surrender to General Blaskowitz, the commander of the German 8th Army. The ceremony would be completed in what remained of the Skoda factory in the area. The surrender became official at 6 p.m. local time. The surrender was generally peaceful, although some Polish units and officers did not obey the order not to destroy their equipment. Some would destroy their equipment in place, while others would take the time to remove crucial components from machine guns and artillery pieces and then drop them in the Vistula so that, you know, the Germans couldn't have any fun with them. In total, between 120 and 140,000 Polish troops would surrender to the Germans over the following days. It took some time for all of the units to get organized and then to hand themselves over to the Germans. Some would be released by the Germans just as the agreement had stated, and if possible, they maybe began to make their way back to their homes and their families. 
They may have felt that the war was over for them, but of course, we know that for Poland, the invasion and the surrender of Warsaw was really only the beginning. For many within Polish society, and at least initially, primarily its social and political leaders, the end of resistance in Warsaw would mark the beginning of another violent phase of occupation. For example, Mayor Stefan Starinsky uh, would be arrested by the Gestapo and sent to prison within Warsaw under SS Guard. Several months later, he would be executed by his German jailers, although his body has never been recovered. The surrender of Warsaw would also be the starting point for the future Polish resistance that would continue throughout the war. By the time that the city surrendered, the Polish army had already distributed orders that a resistance organization should be created, and it would be organized and run along military lines. The men involved would still be considered soldiers of Poland, even if they did all of their activities in secret and while dressed as civilians. But for the vast majority of soldiers that had surrendered at Warsaw, when they were told that they were free to give up their arms and return to their homes, they believed it, and so they did, because the siege of Warsaw was over. One of the enduring legacies of the Second World War is the destruction and death experienced by civilian populations all around the world. The instances of the suffering are are countless and often took new and terrifying forms that had not been seen at all or on the same scale in earlier conflicts. Strategic bombing, and specifically the strategic bombing campaigns against cities, are the largest example, uh, but one that concentrated the suffering more, in my opinion, was the multiple instances of long, drawn-out fighting within cities. The defense of Warsaw is a great example of this, although another example would be the Siege of Shanghai that we discussed in the episodes on the events in China in 1937. In Warsaw, the Polish defenders were outclassed in almost every technological metric of warfare in the 20th century. They were drastically outnumbered in armored vehicles, artillery, and and weapons of all kinds. The defenders of Warsaw had zero air support, and the Luftwaffe had complete control of the air above the capital. And yet, when the Germans really tried to attack into the city, be it when they first arrived on September 8th or in the final days before the surrender, they were unable to make any real progress. The only path forward was through the slow and steady destruction of the entire city, which is where the targeting and suffering of civilians comes into play. In such an environment, the attackers would have to accept making civilians the target, and then accept killing those targets in pursuit of military goals. All of the major powers who would participate in the war would accept this fact. For those defending their territory from foreign attacks, they would be forced to accept the suffering and death of their own citizens if they chose to continue to resist. This was then combined with the absolute brutality of urban combat in the Second World War battlefield. Cities just turned into absolute meat grinders when two forces contested control. Warsaw, in September 1939, saw a glimpse of the kind of suffering and destruction that would occur time and time again all around the world when a military decided to defend a city. It would escape even greater calamity not because the Germans were successful in their attacks or because the Polish defenders no longer were capable of action, but simply because the leaders in the city decided that the suffering in the city needed to end. Next episode, we'll discuss the final areas of Polish resistance, as they would also make the same choice over the last week of September and into early October 1939 to surrender to the Germans, after all other options had been exhausted.